Welcome to the AMONC 2015 opening ceremony. Please welcome your Master of Ceremonies, Maddie Mulholland. Thank you. It is a really big stage, so you're going to have to keep all your applauses going really long when everybody walks across it. Good afternoon, delegates, faculty members, and distinguished guests, honourable ambassadors and consul generals, representatives of the University of Western Australia, City of Perth, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Department of Immigration and Border Protection, and Department of Social Services. Many of you have travelled interstate and internationally to be with us this week, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the opening ceremony of the 21st session of the Asia-Pacific Model United Nations Ceremony Oh, conference, woo. <laughs> Here, for the first time in Perth, Western Australia. Yay! <laughs> My name is Maddie Mulholland, and I am really honoured to be your MC for this afternoon. So we're here at the Riverside Theatre of the Perth Convention and Exhibition Centre, and I'm thinking this stage is a little too big for just one person. What do you guys think? Yeah? Please join me in warmly welcoming the host team behind this year's conference, your 2015 Secretariat and Committee Directors. Before we begin the ceremony, I would like to welcome Sandra Harbin to give us a traditional welcome to country. Kaya, what I said was hello. Um, it's amazing to see so many faces and I understand that um, many of you have travelled from um, other countries and also from around Australia. So I'm a Wajak Baladong Yunga woman which means that uh, I'm an Indigenous person from this part of country. So we are sitting here in Wajak Noongar country. So Kaya, Wanju, Wanju to Wajak Noongar Buja, Ngan Kurt Jurupan Jurupan for Nunukut Binyanin, Ngan Karijan that Nunukut gonna be Wangi, Ni and Karijan Wajak Noongar Buja. So, Ngan asked for the Kwabada Wirin to come in yin and year with Nunukurt. So, Bulyaka Wara Wirin. Bulyaka. What I said was, welcome here to Nunga country. This is Wajak, Nunga country. And so, as you travel around, you might learn a little bit about the Nunga people. And you'll come to understand that our country um, lies within the southwest of Western Australia. And Wajak is just one of 14 Noongar language groups. What I said was my heart is really happy to be here and I understand that you're all going to be talking, listening and learning here on Noongar country. And so what I asked for was for the good spirits to be here and to keep you all safe while you're here in Wajak country and for the wara, for the no good spirits to leave and to go away. So Wanju to Noongar Wajak Buja Kaya. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. We respectfully acknowledge the past and present traditional owners of this land in which we are meeting, the Noongar people. It is a privilege to be standing on Noongar country. Since 1995, AMUNC has travelled to eight cities and 16 universities throughout the Asia Pacific. Now, for its 21st birthday, we have the pleasure of welcoming the conference to Perth for the very first time. This week is about challenging yourself and connecting with different people and different ideas. So I've got a secret to share with you all. Before today, I've never actually been involved in Model United Nations. So while I don't have any particular experience with AMUNC um, or Model UN in general, I am a fellow student leader. I've been involved in student advocacy and activities since 2011, culminating in being the president of the clubs and societies at my university, the University of WA, 
advocating for education at a faculty and administration level, and now sitting on the University Senate. So I'd like to take a couple of minutes before we hear from our incredible speakers today to applaud you on the leadership that you are taking by being part of this conference. Kofi Annan said, you're never too young to lead. Be the change that you want to see. I think we all know that one. Ban Ki-moon has taken a very strong stance in involving youth and in decision making, and he urges world leaders to invest in youth. At a summit in Portugal, Ban Ki-moon said, and I'm gonna quote this, as the young leaders of tomorrow, you have the passion and energy and commitment to make a difference. What I'd really urge you to do is to have a global vision. Go beyond your country and go beyond your national boundaries. You have to work and think about what we can make this world a better place for all. This is what I'd like to ask our young leaders. We will try as leaders today to minimise the problems which we will hand over to you. But it is to you. You have to take ownership and leadership of tomorrow. For that to be possible, you have to strengthen your capacity and widen your vision as global citizens. What we, as young advocates, can take from these words is that we need to continue to engage and look at the important issues facing all parts of our society here and around the world. We need to unite together to have a strong voice. And there is no better time to start that than this week. This week, you will be hearing from and engaging with very knowledgeable and distinguished speakers. So you have the challenge of taking each opportunity to learn, to develop friendships, to understand different ideas and viewpoints, and to work together to be inspired by the leaders around you. So to start this journey of personal and collective growth, I would like to introduce you to our first guest. Lisa Scafidi was elected as the first female Lord Mayor of the City of Perth in 2007, and since then has worked passionately to represent Perth locally, nationally, and internationally. Prior to being elected Lord Mayor, Ms Scafidi served two full terms as a councillor in the City of Perth, and was the State Director of the Committee for Economic Development of Australia for over 10 years. I am delighted on behalf of the Perth host team of AMUNC 2015 to invite the Right Honourable, the Lord Mayor, Lisa Scafidi, to make the opening remarks and welcome you to our home city, Perth. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction, Maddie. And welcome to Perth, everybody. It's so beautiful to see so many young people in the heart of our capital city this afternoon. I would also like to acknowledge Professor Paul Johnson, the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Western Australia, also to Hadi Mustafa from the Malaysian Consulate, Ms Chihelka Zednik from the Czech Consulate and the Head of the UK Trade and Investment uh, for Perth, Mr Andrew Beveridge. To all of the delegates this afternoon, I really hope that you will enjoy your conference as it plays out over the next day or so. It's wonderful, I was just uh, out the front there when I heard it was the 21st conference and you made the comment, Maddie, that uh, the event is coming of age. Well, how appropriate for you to be in Perth when we feel our city is coming of age. We feel that our city is now truly aware of its sense of self and its position on the local, national and international stage. And that's something that I've been very proud to be a part of as a Perth-born Western Australian woman myself someone who's grown up here, uh, feeling that our city could exude a little bit more personality than it was. And I feel now we're very much on the right track and really tracking very well to continue to be a city of substance. And so I think there's quite a nice fit there. So as we've heard, there's quite a lot of students who have come from overseas and also many locals to participate in this particular event. And it's a great way to meet people from all over the world and certainly at this particular point in your life, certainly probably to connect with people who could be uh, very important to you in the future. So networking is definitely the way to go for the next few days. But uh, Western Australia is a very proud multicultural home to people from about 200 nationalities. So we always speak of our proud multiculturalism here in Australia and uh, very much so here in Perth, Western Australia. We have more than 170 languages that are spoken and heard and we have a multitude of faiths that are practised. So Perth also hosts 
56 countries with official government representation, with new consulates opening every year, some of which I know are being represented here today. We're also very proud of the fact that this year, uh, the New York Times, no least, ranked Perth as the ninth best city to visit in the world. And in August last year, Perth again rated among the top 10 list of The Economist magazine's livability index as one of the top 10 most livable cities. So we're very proud of that livability that we boast. We believe that we do put our best foot forward and we're going through a very fast period of change at the moment. Our city is going through a lot of construction as we start to appreciate the need for more capacity and we are creating new precincts that we hope will be filled with new businesses. Obviously a strong reliance on the mining and resources sector but also a growing appreciation for the importance of science and other creative industries. We match that with a beautiful climate that is described more often than not as a Mediterranean climate, but a beautiful sunny climate, and as you can see, even in the midst of winter, we have stunningly beautiful blue skies. So we're very proud of what we have to offer and hope that you will enjoy your time here. I've heard about the celebrations that your host team have been working on, and it sounds like there is going to be a very enjoyable program in store for you. I know that you've got some fun nights planned in Northbridge, you're going to Crown Perth, and of course spending many times here in the city, the heart of the city. So we know that you'll enjoy that. We've been very busy creating a safe, vibrant place for all people from all walks of life to enjoy. And uh, as you will see, there is great coffee, lovely small wine bars, and beautiful restaurants and venues to participate in. We've been very much on a mission during my mayoral tenure of rejuvenation, uh, reactivation, refreshment. And we've done a lot of street revitalisation and we've even looked at our laneways to create out of the way places where people can just get off the beaten track and enjoy what we've had. I often describe the role of Lord Mayor as being uh, either like doing some embroidery or connecting the dots. I'm always trying to bring the right people together and put the finishing touches on our urban landscape. But also we've been very focused on uh, digital technology and the importance that new technology and online channels have within our city. We're very proud of the Wi-Fi connectivity we have in our city within the CBD block, literally from the bell tower through to Northbridge, you can stay connected on free city Wi-Fi, which I hope some of you may have already discovered. As I say, we're unashamedly going through a major city transformation at this point in time. I believe this is perhaps still an early part of our journey as we really do have all of the right uh, measures to, to perhaps put Perth in the position of being a strong future global city. Therefore, I really hope that many of you will love your time here so much that you would even consider perhaps looking to future employment opportunities in this city or, dare I say, even future residential opportunities. We are really proud of our position as Australia's Indian Ocean Rim capital city. We believe that strategically we occupy a very interesting position and we really want to look towards our place in the Indian Ocean Rim more strongly into the future, but also very aware of our connection up into Asia via the longitudinal time zone. The university have proudly coined a phrase called in the zone, which speaks of the longitudinal time zone and harks to the fact that this is the time zone that represents about 60% of the world's population. We're very proud of the strong uh, ability we have based on the resources we have here, particularly oil, natural gas and iron ore. We are the only state really with uh, the connection to the Indian Ocean uh, where most or I should say 80% of the world's seaborne trade is in transit to or through our destination. No other part of Australia has such deep and meaningful connections with Indonesia, China and India, the leading nations of emerging Asia. This week as delegates of different nations, I'm sure you will be talking about and also witnessing the consequences of your decisions and actions 
positive and negative. I think you're in a very important position given your age and position in life to be very influential in the future. And so I really do thank you for your commitment and your time in what you're doing. You will be developing very interesting networks that will serve you well. I think it's hard to imagine at this age how that is actually the case. But I look back on my own career path and realise that many of the people I connected with in my late teens and early 20s are still very influential in my life today because we've incrementally all gone along our career paths at the same time. And so we do continue to deal with each other, albeit on a different, uh, more senior level. Let me just close by saying that the City of Perth is very proud of the international alliances we have globally. We work very well in a number of ways. Obviously, you would have heard of sister cities. We have sister and friendship cities in China, the United States, Japan, Greece, Taiwan, Italy, Scotland and Korea. We are also the only city and a founding partner at that of the World Energy Cities Partnership. I was proud to be the chair of that alliance in 2009 and 10. That is now a 24 city alliance globally with a focus on energy producing cities around the world. So equally, the model of the United Nations Conference that you're a part of is also a fantastic way to be connected globally and to really look at uh, government and international affairs. I think that all of these relationships will see Perth positioned as a city of significance economically and, as I said, with the resources focus that we have. We're also a very strong city in the educational stakes. We have uh, great universities and very you know, good colleges and schools. And I think, therefore, along with the opportunity to then provide employment for many people as they graduate, this is also enhancing our position globally. So again, let me just strongly welcome you to our city. I hope that you enjoy the next few days really make the most of the networking time, obviously the intellectual stimulation that these conference programs bring to you and really look forward to your place in the world into the future. I love the youth we have today. You are so engaged, you are so community minded and yet you are civically proud and internationally aware. So I think as you develop a deeper sense of global citizenship, your awareness of your actions you know are going to have great impact on the globe as you and the globe grow together. You have an important role to play in shaping our global future and responding to what are going to be some significant global challenges. I do wish you all the very best and for this, the Asia Pacific Model United Nations Conference 2015 and your individual futures. Please know you are and always will be very welcome to visit Perth, Western Australia. Thank you for listening and enjoy the conference. Thank you, Lord Mayor. There's certainly some exciting things happening in Perth and I do encourage you to go exploring a little bit while you're here. Our next speaker has quite a connection to AMUNC having been Vice-Chancellor of La Trobe University when they hosted the conference in 2012, and now Vice-Chancellor of the 2015 host university, the University of Western Australia. For all students out there who are hopeful that their university will host it sometime in the future, he may well hold the key. Professor Paul Johnson received his doctorate from Oxford University in 1982, and has worked as an expert advisor to the World Bank, the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development, the British government, and the House of Lords. Please give a warm welcome to our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Paul Johnson. Thanks very much, Maddie. Uh, delegates, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me here today uh, to such an important uh, and exciting event. I'd particularly like to acknowledge the model UN Secretary General and University of Western Australia alumnus, uh, Rida Ahmed, who will be in charge of you, I guess, over the next uh, several days. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the City of Perth's Lord Mayor, Lisa Scafidi, from whom you've just heard, and our other distinguished guests uh, here today. And I 
very much hope you will all enjoy your stay here in Perth and uh, um, outside of the hard work that you'll be doing here in the Convention Centre also have time to enjoy this fantastic city. I, I'm particularly um, pleased to see all of you here today and uh, particularly pleased because the fact that you're participating in the Model United Nations Conference shows that you are all focused on engaging with policy and policy development. So though you will all have your own other aspects of your lives and, and many of you of course are currently studying or have recently studied at university uh, with um, an academic focus, you're also very much engaged in policy. And I think it's very important that from within the university sector, we do, as well as carrying forward our purely academic work, um, focus on the big policy issues that need to be addressed in the world today. And events like the Model United Nations Conference are really important because they create opportunities for cross-cultural and international dialogue. And they also give people like me an opportunity to speak to the next generation of politicians, activists, economic advisors, and reformers. That is you. Uh, you will take those roles in your future careers. You will have a great impact on the world in which you're living. That's good because you've got a lot of responsibilities to carry. Your generation has a huge task ahead. You face some of the biggest challenges that humanity has ever faced. Um, and many of these issues, climate change, um, inequality, civil war, population pressure, cultural and religious intolerance, uh, these issues though you have to solve them, have largely been created by my generation. Um, and your challenge will be to find the answers that my generation has failed to find. The Model United Nations Conference is a fantastic opportunity for you to develop your ideas and refine your skills, because they will be ideas and skills in much demand in the future. Holding this 21st Model United Nations Conference here in Perth is, I think, particularly relevant because, as the Lord Mayor said, Perth is right at the centre of a global time zone, plus or minus two hours, that embraces 60% of the world's population. This time zone currently accounts for $23 trillion of economic activity. That's currently a third of the world's total economic activity. By the mid-21st century, century that is your century, this time zone will account for over half of all the world's production and consumption. And uh, it is essential then that what happens within this time zone um, is done, is carried forward uh, with the very uh, best um, and strongest commitment to the goals of the United Nations, because this is going to be the formative part of the world for the next 50 years. The, as I'm sure you're all well aware, both the economic and the geopolitical center of gravity is shifting from the North Atlantic to the Asia Pacific, and in particular to uh, this time zone. Um, as the Lord Mayor said a few years ago at the University of Western Australia, we developed this concept of being in the zone, this dynamic time zone that's driving the world's economy uh, and the world's um, uh, politics over currently and over the next decades to come. And we created this to enhance our thinking, our understanding and our knowledge about the region in which we find ourselves and to emphasize the huge interdependence we have. The Lord Mayor emphasized some of that interdependence in terms of trade and economic activity. And it's something that we have to take really, really seriously. Each person, each family, each community, each nation is intrinsically and fundamentally interconnected with and reliant on others. That interdependence and that reliance is fundamental to life in a modern society, yet it is still much easier for us as individuals and, and in the societies in which we live, it's still easier for us to identify differences and disagreements than it is the many things that we have in common. 
And I think it is through focusing on our common humanity and our common interests that we can most effectively find ways to take the world forward, to create a better place, a place with less conflict, less inequality, less environmental challenge to the sorts of lives we live. And to make us all aware that though we enjoy, of course, the privileges that uh, we have in our own particular lives and, and uh, cultures, uh, that there are many people who don't have that. And indeed, much of the conflict that we see in many places of the world ultimately is a conflict about lifestyle. It's about a conflict about claims over resources. And uh, uh, one of the challenges that no doubt you will be addressing over the next several days is how to uh, balance the uh, sense of um, concentration of wealth and privilege in some societies, which is often said to drive the global economy forward, and that sense uh, in other parts of the world, that sense of exclusion, uh, which can turn either to um, uh, desolation uh, or perhaps uh, uh, an aggressive claim on uh, the resources that others have. Um, so uh, we know that these are major challenges that we all have to face. I guess a question for you over the next several days is um, how do you get how do you get different societies, different countries, nations, interest groups to focus on those bigger global concerns of humanity rather than their own personal or local interests? Because after all, a lot of the conflict, whether it's armed conflict or ideological conflict in the world or economic competition, is driven by um, those local uh, and personal interests. I think one of the ways forward is through education. We know just how important uh, education, education and research is. Uh, if it wasn't for education, if it wasn't for research, uh, we can be fairly sure that the world would be um, an even less um, successful environment for us all to live in than it is today. And I've no doubt that as you discuss the major challenges this week, security, climate change, humanitarian aid, health uh, and so on, um, you must recognize that one of the key foundations to addressing any, any or all of these issues is going to be a commitment by world leaders for an increase in investment in education at all levels, but there is still a huge challenge around the world to ensure that all children receive a decent primary education, that all children are literate, that all children have the privilege Everyone in this room has a privilege of, and that is being able to develop their ideas and express them uh, without fear or favor. And in fact, because nearly everyone here has experience of life in a university, you might want to think about what it is that universities do and what some of the values of universities um, are. And the University of Western Australia is an example, but perhaps an example no different from most other universities. Uh, UWA is um, a place made up of students and staff from well over 100 different nations. It's a place that encourages debate. It encourages the development and exchange of ideas. It's a place that recognizes that religion, race, and gender shouldn't inhibit us from coming together to debate and devise new ideas. In fact, not only should these apparent differences not inhibit us, they should in fact be celebrated because it is the diversity of ideas. It is when one set of ideas that appears to be so obvious and, and uncontested is challenged by another set of ideas that the world moves on. Um, so it is universities and it's the, the nature of dialogue in universities uh, that I think sets um, in some ways a model for how we would wish to uh, conduct discourse uh, in a model United Nations, but within our societies, within our nation states as well. It's also a case, I think, that most universities acknowledge that they are there not just for themselves, not just to serve themselves or even their closest neighbors, but universities have a duty to help those in the most complex and dangerous places in the world. Universities themselves are places of peaceful dialogue and exchange of views, 
And it is that security of the environment in, in a university that provides a foundation for people to try out new ideas uh, and radical ideas. Um, there are few developments in the world, whether in science or economics or politics or philosophy, that have been uncontested. The most Nobel Prize winners will tell you that at some point they have had to battle on and on and on against conventional wisdom to have their ideas uh, accepted. And so it is with any change. We all build on what has gone before. And when we look at some of the great issues that you'll be facing, um, this week and, and grappling with, um, we have to recognize that it is very easy to give up. It's very easy to say for the issues of poverty or pandemics or climate change or terrorism, uh, it's just too difficult. It's just too difficult to find an answer. It just seems impossible to find an answer. But in fact, history shows us that we can find ways through these challenges. Just uh, two years ago, in 2013, the world celebrated as India was taken off the list of countries that had any new reported cases of polio. India was declared polio-free. But just 25 years before that, a 1,000 children a day in India were being paralyzed by polio. 25 years ago, it seemed absolutely impossible that polio could be eradicated in India. There wasn't the money, there wasn't the healthcare system, there wasn't the bureaucracy, and so on. But it was achieved. Um, a commitment to do something, even if that something appears to be impossible, uh, can be achieved. And in, in the case of polio, it was medical scientists and researchers, governments, businesses, and individuals who managed to achieve that great outcome. And each one of you would be very well aware of many other impossibles that have been achieved. And they're achieved through individual and collective effort. And we know it is through that individual and collective effort that we can make the world a better place. Usually not in a great leap forward, but through a number of small, sometimes apparently insignificant steps, but a number of small steps. And I think each one of us has a personal responsibility to be a little bit dissatisfied with the world in which we're living. We should all be a little bit dissatisfied because we all know that the world can be just a little bit better. And if we keep that dissatisfaction but we turn it to positive effect, uh, then we will, uh, we will move the world on. It is that sense of, uh, of tackling the big issues, those impossible issues and having an impact on them that led UWA to use that tagline that you saw pursue impossible that you saw in our, our little video early on. We believe that as a university and that all universities have that responsibility. So my very best wishes to you all for what I've no doubt will be a very interesting time here, a wonderful learning experience, learning about others, but I'm sure each one of you will learn something about yourself this week. And learning about yourself is always a very good thing. I also hope that you'll take every opportunity you can to network, to engage with each other, um, and, of course, to have fun. So I wish you all the very best for your deliberations here in Perth this week, uh, and the very best for your future careers, careers as leaders of your generation. Because, to be honest, the world needs your talents. Thanks very much. Thank you, Vice-Chancellor, for your important message about the opportunities we have, but also the responsibilities that we have. Each of our speakers today has highlighted the importance of the work that you will be doing this week and carrying that into your communities, and also being strong and empowered young leaders. Our final speaker knows all too well the life of being a young leader. I've had the pleasure of working alongside her in her various leadership roles, and the success of this week can be attributed to the hard work that she has put in over the last 12 months. Please give a big, warm, Amunk welcome to the 21st Secretary General of the Asia Pacific Model United Nations Conference, Rita Ahmed.
Thank you, Maddie. <clears throat> Esteemed guests, honorable ambassadors and consul generals, the right honorable the Lord Mayor, Ms. Lisa Scafidi, Professor Paul Johnson, the 2015 Secretariat, faculty advisors and honorable delegates. Welcome to the 21st annual Asia Pacific Model United Nations Conference. It is a great honor and privilege to serve as your Secretary General for AMUNC 2015. 21 years have passed since the inaugural AMUNC in 1995. And today it has truly become a conference bringing together young minds from all across the region to a place they never thought they'd have to visit, the city of Perth. This of course would not have been possible without the tireless work and endless dedication of the host secretariat sitting here with me to make sure that you have a memorable time in the city we are proud to call home and to provide you with the best delegate experience possible. I would also like to thank our wonderful sponsors for helping making this conference possible, including the Perth Convention Bureau, the University of Western Australia, the City of Perth, and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. I'd also like to extend our thanks to our partners whose support has been invaluable to AMUNC, including the Student Guild of UWA, Murdoch University, Claremont Quarter, and the Woodlands Winery. On a personal note, I'd also like to give a sincere thanks to Ms. Jocelyn Skeggs, Mr. John Stubbs, Mr. Tony Goodman, and Dr. Zareen Siddiqui. Your encouragement, as well as your support, has been invaluable in making this week a reality for us. Thank you. In 2008, I attended my first Model UN conference. While much has changed in the world since then, one thing that has remained the same is the vital importance of the United Nations. What remains the same is the necessity for a global forum where world leaders can come together and negotiate and find solutions for the critical problems that we face. We, the peoples of the United Nations, determined to promote social progress and a better standard of life. That is the preamble of the United Nations Charter, which just last week celebrated 70 years since its launch. 70 years later, it's hard to name one region in this world which doesn't face some sort of crisis or conflict. We live in a world struck by poverty, inequality, and violence. And by taking on the role of someone else this week and understanding their stance on specific issues and learning to empathize, we Model UNers are able to bridge the gaps of such conflicts. This is why Model UN will be an enriching experience for you. It will provide you with the opportunity to take the first step towards change, making you conscious of what is happening around the world surrounding us. You are the future diplomats, the future teachers, the mothers and fathers of tomorrow's youth and it is your duty to eliminate the misunderstandings fueling the conflicts of today, and to promote dialogue and debate over war and violence. For a lot of you, Model UN is no longer a new world, and taking part in MUN or using MUN terminology is a daily part of life. But every now and then you get asked what the point of this is. How are we bettering the world by imitating to be the UN? But we are not here to imitate or pretend the, to be the UN, or imitate the international relations of today. We are here to advance the international relations of tomorrow. In the next six days, you have the opportunity to be a diplomat or an ambassador, be an international expert or a leading NGO. You can make decisions and create solutions which are unprecedented. You are in a world where anything can happen and you can pursue the impossible. You will find innovative yet feasible solutions to over 30 issues being discussed at this conference, including the global food crisis, the impact of anti-vaccination movements, and the implementation of green economies. This week, you will prove to international leaders of today that their idea of impossible is our generation's possible. I encourage you to take debate in the following week and give it your all. And if you do, I can guarantee that the experience you gain will stick with you for life. But also remember to enjoy and have fun along the way. Students participating in AMUNC not only expand their knowledge through the platform provided to them, but also regard this conference as a chance to make lifelong friends from across Australia and the Asia Pacific. At social events, don't just stick with your delegation or your committee. Meet someone from a different country and learn a foreign slang term. You will have the chance to make new friends from all across the region, whether it's Sydney or Surabaya or Malaysia or Melbourne. And as you do, remember that you are not only representing your assigned countries, you are also representing your home country, your university and your delegations. You are an ambassador both in and outside of committee, so go out and meet your fellow delegates. Share something about the city you come from and learn something about theirs. And also, when you are not in committee or at the conference, make sure you venture out and see the beautiful city of Perth. 
Once again, this conference would not have been here today if it wasn't for the Perth Host team, our sponsors, and their generosity. Above all, I want to thank the delegates and the faculty advisors for making this conference possible. I hope that each and every one of you will experience and understand how amazing it will be to be involved in AMUNC 2015, and I wish you all the very best for the upcoming week. It gives me great pleasure to declare the 21st session of the Asia-Pacific Model United Nations Conference open. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. That wraps up the opening ceremony, but the conference has only just begun. I hope that throughout the week you learn, get inspired, have ideas that will change the world and make lifelong friends, or at least find a couch in every city in the Asia Pacific you can sleep on. Thank you for attending our opening ceremony today. We hope you've had a fantastic week. Please make sure you share all of your experience with us by hashtagging AMUNC2015 on social media throughout the week and best of luck. <laughs>